Let's now turn our attention back to the video screen to hear about our next recipient, whom, by the way, needs no introduction. Whether it was listening to Stella Dallas and other soaps with his mom after school or pretending to be Gene Autry's Sunday sidekick on Melody Ranch, Wink Martindale's fascination with radio began during childhood. Playmates may have aspired to being doctors, firemen, or policemen. Wink just wanted to be a radio announcer. His journey from Jackson Sun paper carrier to legendary status in radio and television began in his small hometown, Jackson, Tennessee. While attending classes at Lambeth College, he got his first on-air job paying $25 a week. After two quarters, he began working full-time and moved his way up to the town's larger stations and soon found himself at Memphis's number one station, WHBQ. His mentors at the time convinced him to finish his college education at then Memphis State, where he was voted Mr. Fabulous of the sophomore class. Wink admittedly received several speeding tickets on Central Avenue trying to keep up with his busy schedule rushing between classes and the radio station. When WHBQ TV signed on the air, Wink became a popular local television personality as well. We hung out some with Dewey Phillips and Elvis, Wink and I did. In fact, I helped Wink get Elvis on his TV show. Wink Martindale holds the distinction of being the only television guy in America that had Elvis Presley on a local TV show. Elvis Presley, I want to thank you again because thank we know you're a busy man and thanks a lot for coming by and seeing us at the dance party and saying hello to all your friends here in Memphis and the Mid-South. Anytime you're in town and want to come by, we certainly will welcome you. Well, thank you very much, Wink, and I'll see you again. Okay, all thanks right. a lot. In 1959, Wink ventured west to Los Angeles where he was featured on several large stations. He took that big step, man, which was a big, big step, and that's to go to Hollywood. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Hollywood. It's tough out there, man. I'd say one in a hundred make it when they go out there and say they're going to be big stars. But Wink went out there, and he had something that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, he had looks. Wink Martin had a great voice, but uh, he was a hard-working guy, and he was very sincere, and they recognized that in Hollywood. His radio dream was fully realized in 1971 when he began a 12-year run as the midday personality on Gene Autry's flagship, Station of the Stars, KMPC. Along the way, there was his teen-oriented dance party, a platinum record, deck of cards that earned him an appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now here's a very attractive young fellow from Memphis, Tennessee. His name is Wink Martindale. Wonderful, Wink. Well, the whole family must be very delighted with your record, and so are yes, we. So is Thank you so much. And a record 21 game shows that Wink either hosted or produced, including Trivial Pursuit, Can You Top This, High Rollers, Debt, Gambit, and the long-running Tic Tac Doe. I'll be honest with you. I've never met a person in radio like Wink Martindale. And that includes talent, voice, looks, friendliness, hardworking guy. In 2006, Wink received his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In spite of his fame, Wink hasn't forgotten his Tennessee roots and values and his relationships with family. His wife of 31 years, Sandy, four children, seven grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Hey, this is GK, Winker. You deserve everything you get, mister, and you got it. Congratulations, Wink. I'm being recognized by our college, the University of Memphis. Congratulations, Wink. Congratulations, Wink Martindale, 2015 Distinguished Alumnus. Please welcome Distinguished Alumnus for Lifetime the Achievement, the little Mr. Fabulous, fly. our very own Wink All Martindale. You wander down the lane and far away Leaving me a song Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you, Dr. Rudd. It's great to be home. It's always great to come home. I've always considered Memphis and Jackson to a degree as my home, even though I've been in Los Angeles since March of 1959. I have to tell you, I have it on good authority. They wanted Alex Trebek tonight. <laughs> too expensive, too much money. That Sajak gets paid by the word. 
I show up for a free meal, folks. <laughs> I'm no dummy. After that video and nice introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> Had lunch today with a very busy President Rudd and Loretta. First thing Loretta said when she met me today, Wink, you're looking terrific, which ordinarily would be nice to hear until I realized the three stages of man are youth, middle age, and gee, Wink, you look terrific. So if anybody ever says that to you, don't accept it as a compliment. I'd be remiss if I failed to introduce my wife of 40 years, not 34 or 36, 40 years this coming August 2nd. Standy, would you please stand, please? And remain standing for a second. I'm going to have her remain standing because she's short of stature, and a lot of you people in the back may not even be able to see her. On our 39th anniversary last summer, I took Sandy to the restaurant where we enjoyed our first date, the Chart House at Malibu on Pacific Coast Highway. And during dinner, I just happened to say, can you believe it, Sandy, 38 years ago, we had a small apartment, a used Chevy. We slept on a sofa bed and watched a 10-inch black and white television. And you were a 30-something. And now we live in a beautiful home in Calabasas, California. We each drive a new car. We sleep in a fabulously comfortable, oversized uh, and bed. And we watch a new Samsung curved plasma screen television. But instead of stopping when I was ahead at that point, I made the mistake of continuing. I said, now I'm married to a 60-something. Well, Sandy took what I said in the wrong way, and she said, well, sweetheart, that may be true, but let me say, if you ever feel the urge, you feel free to go find yourself a new 30-something, and I'll make sure that once again, you'll be living in a cheap apartment driving a beat-up Chevy, sleeping on a sofa bed, and watching a 10-inch black-and-white television. <laughs> Women really know how to get to the heart of it, don't they, guys? Huh? You can sit down now, sweetheart. <laughs> I am both honored and humbled to be the recipient of this most prestigious award. Truthfully, my grade average was a bit on the shy side of a four-pointer, ladies and gentlemen. As a member of the class of 57, sometimes it seems like 1857, but it was really 1957, when I received my Bachelor of Science degree, um, had someone told me on my next visit to this campus, which was today, would be to receive a Distinguished Alumni Award, it's likely I would have thought they were smoking something kind of funny. <laughs> not, uh, not true, though. That said, here I am, and gratefully so. Class of 57, that is a vivid reminder to me of my status as a bona fide senior citizen. When I was a kid in Jackson, Tennessee, 85 miles away, practicing for a job in radio, friends and family would say, you know, Wink does a nice job for his age. And sadly, now I'm hearing the same damn thing all over again. <laughs> Wink does a nice, well, time does march on. But on the subject of age, I think Jeff Foxworthy said it best. You know you're getting older when you bend down to touch your shoelaces and you ask yourself, what can I possibly do while I'm down here? <laughs> but seriously, whoever said, if you find something you like to do, you'll never have to work a day in your life, must have had me in mind. For I wanted to be on the radio from the time I knew what one of these microphones was. My fascination with radio, as they said on the screen a few minutes ago, began when I was seven or eight years old. I'd come home after school and listen to my mom's radio soaps with her, shows like Stella Dallas, Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle, The Romance of Helen Trent, and so many more. Saturday night, it was your hit parade and the Grand Ole Opry. Sunday, Gene Autry's Melody Ranch. And in a touch of irony, of course, much later I'd work for the cowboy for 12 years at his flagship station in Los Angeles, KMPC. A must on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock for me was Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
And then Jay Justin, who played the title role, would come on and he would say, and it should be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limits of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to deliver with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Now folks, for somebody who can't remember his name on occasion, for me to hear that, you can imagine, for me to be able to remember that today, you can imagine how impressed I was. In this brief period I have, I'd like to share three memories from over 60 years in radio and television that stand out over all other possibilities. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what would I say here tonight? And the first memory I'd like to share with you is one that perhaps some of you are aware of. I go back to a hot July night in 1954. I'm the morning man at WHBQ doing a show called Clock Watchers. And in the morning, I'm playing vanilla music like Patti Page and Joe Stafford and Eddie Fisher. And at night, a guy named Dewey Phillips is playing black music for white kids, really. It's just before rhythm and blues turns into rock and roll, the show called Blackboard Jungle, Rock Around the Clock comes out. And we're in that time frame. And one night in July, 1954, I'm taking some of my ex-football playing buddies from Jackson around the radio station to show it to them. They wanted to see what WHBQ looked like. All of a sudden, I hear this commotion in the control room where Dewey Phillips was doing his show, 9 to Midnight, called Red Hot and Blue. And I left the guys and I said, let me see what this is. So I went up to his control room. Sam Phillips, founder of Sun Records, had walked in with an acetate, not a record because the record hadn't even been pressed yet. It was an acetate of That's All Right Mama by a truck driving singer with Crown Electric called Elvis Presley. He put it on the turntable, he played it, and the switchboard lit up. And the rest is almost like history. He played it over and over again. Sam had the telephone number of Gladys and Vernon who lived in low-rent housing, Lauderdale Courts. And he gave me the telephone number to call Gladys and Vernon. So I went outside, got on the phone. They were listening, they heard the excitement. And I said, is there any way we can get Elvis to come to the radio station? And they said, well, he went to see a double feature at the Suzors over on Decatur Street. Because he knew his record was going to be played. And he was so nervous about it. So they got in their truck and they went down to the Suzors walked up and down the dark aisles and found Elvis sitting there watching the movie, whispered to him the excitement that was, being, that was going on at WHBQ on the air, and they brought him down to the station. Dewey sat him down in front of a microphone and interviewed him for the first time. Elvis often said had he known he was being interviewed live on the air, he wouldn't have been able to do it because he was so withdrawn and so uh, quiet, uh, is a nice way of putting it at the time, introverted. I was there that night. I'm the only living person who was in that studio the night that Elvis was discovered. That was the beginning of Presley mania. And of course, after that, all hell breaks loose and everybody knows the story after that. The next week, they went in and recorded a flip side called Blue Moon in Kentucky. The record came out, it was a local hit. RCA came along and we know that story of Heartbreak Hotel. That was in July of 1954. Again, my second memory takes place at WHBQ. It's the days when I was hosting Top 10 Dance Party on Channel 13, the year was 1955, a year later. And as the film said, as a sophomore at Memphis State, fellow student Janelle Brower and I had been elected Mr. and Miss Fabulous <laughs> of the, it is kind of funny, isn't it? Of the sophomore class and the fact that I was getting more and more publicity because of my work on television on Channel 13. Apparently my mentor and my boss, John Cleghorn, general manager of WHPQ, felt that he needed to remind this youngster to keep his feet on solid ground. So he wrote a memo to me, one that I've kept all these years, and I'd like to share it with you, and I think after I read it, you'll see why I kept it. It's dated March 20th, 1955. 60 years ago, he wrote, Dear Winston, I make it a practice to congratulate other people when they receive an extraordinary honor. But if you don't mind taking advice from an old man, the secret of continuation of your popularity is to remember three things. First, if you want people to like you, you must have a genuine love for the human race. 
Second, the only way to avoid arrogance that comes with outstanding success is to remember that you are God's creature and what you've achieved is due to him and not due to your own accomplishments. If you can remain humble and surrendered instrument in his hands, there is no limit to the good that you can do. Thirdly, if you forget that you're God's creature, you can fall a lot further and a lot faster than you can ever climb. That said, he concluded with these words, it's a pleasure to have you on the station. Sincerely, John Clegger, and General Manager, WHBQ Radio and Television. Needless to say, Mr. Clegger's note impressed me as it said a great deal in a very few words. I only wish it were possible for Mr. Clegger to be here this evening. I know he would be pleased and he would be proud. The final memory is a more recent one. It's an indelible reminder that when you open a radio microphone or when you look into a television camera, you never know who or how the words might affect a listener or a viewer. With the unbearable, horrific story of the recently downed German Wings airliner still very much on all of our minds, I want to leave you with this. Three years after 9-11, Sandy and I were attending a charity event at the Universal Sheraton in Los Angeles. And during the silent auction, a gentleman came up and introduced himself to me and he said, Wink, I'd like to tell you what my brother would say tonight were he here. He began by telling me what a fan his brother was of a game show that I hosted for years called Tic Tac Doe. But his brother was such a fan, such a fan that every weekend, he would drive up from San Diego, where he was an officer in the Navy, just to watch tapings of the show at CBS Television City. He said it finally reached a point where just coming up and watching the tapings wasn't enough. He wanted to be a contestant on the show. So sure enough, he came up midweek, went to Barry and Enright, our producers in Century City, and he auditioned, and he got on the show. And actually, he won several thousand dollars before being eliminated. But that wasn't all that important to him. It was at this point I began to sense just how important these appearances were to his brother. So I offered to find them and make DVD copies to which he thanked me, but he said, sadly, my brother is no longer with us, Wink. And it was then that Brad Burlingame told me that his brother, who loved my show with a passion, was the same Captain Charles Chick Burlingame the American Airlines pilot who lost his life when forced to fly his plane into the Pentagon after being hijacked on 9-11. The recent tragedy in the French Alps reminded me of this story and how even a simple game show could mean so much to someone. And it reminded me that each one of us is put here on earth to learn, to share, to love, to appreciate, and give of ourselves. None of us here this evening has any way at all of knowing when this fantastic experience on God's earth will end. It can be taken away at any moment. Perhaps this is God's way of telling us that we must make the most out of every single day that we live. Remember that life isn't measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. I leave you with these thoughts. The nicest place to be is in someone's thoughts. The safest place to be is in someone's prayers. And the very best place to be in the hands of God. President Rudd, I want you to know that I place this evening, and I mean this sincerely, at the very apex of my 60 plus years in the business. To be given this honor by my alma mater in the city where I began my quest for success in my chosen profession, it just doesn't get any better than this. So to President Rudd and to all connected with this award-filled evening, my sincerest appreciation. May God bless each of you. May God bless the University of Memphis 
and may God bless this great country. Thank you.